Okay. Hi, my name is Sarah Vispol, and I'm a senior director here in ACT Next in charge of assessment design. And I want to welcome you to the 23rd Tech Talk here at ACT campus. I have the uh, privilege and honor to introduce Jay Thomas, who's going to do our topic today, which is really cool, which is about eye tracking. So uh, again, thanks for taking the time to come, but I think we're all going to enjoy it. Uh, Jay comes to us. Uh, after 20 years of teaching in the classroom. Science teacher. He came to ACT about six years ago and came to our team in a project called ABG, for those of you that may remember having to do with different dimensions. <laughs> we knew things were more than just academic. We knew they had other things going on, so we studied that and ended up with the ACT Holistic Framework, of which Jay Thomas uh, is responsible for most of the science section of that. It goes over the content and learning progressions and some of the misconceptions. And so among that research, he's also identified by Andy Anderson and some people to, hey, could you help us work on some NGSS scoring and three-dimensional three science items and things like that. So Jay's really always been interested in that insight of the cognitive processes that go behind those science type things and, and learning in general. That is extended to some of our new assessments, like the graphic literacy test on the work keys. And um, so one of the tools that he's really become proficient in using and is going to share with you today is eye tracking. And he has a, like a dozen presentations and publication going on so that we are, uh, it's time now for him to start us off and teach us about eye track. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And now we're not working. Where are we? That's how it works. Computer? Yeah. Technology. Uh, might have to put it back into the window. Okay. Wow. Ah. Okay. So here's an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. We're going to talk about assessment design science. Um, one of the things to be aware about is all of this came about from a desire to look at assessment design from a scientific perspective where we need uh, evidence to support our claims and reasoning. And we're going to talk about eye, eye tracking as validity evidence for cognitive processes in view of the standards. And then we're going to talk about some traditional eye tracking that a lot of people have been doing for user experience and those sorts of things. Then we're going to talk about pupillometry and cognitive load. Uh, and then we're going to talk about next steps where ACT is hoping to go in the future. And then I'll field some questions from hopefully inside and outside the room. So. The idea of principled assessment design is all based upon the Pellegrino work uh, with the assessment triangle from almost 20 years ago now, where we need to think about what observations we can make in our item design, what interpretation and claims we want to make about students and cognition. And there's a whole bunch of them. Evidence-centered design is probably the best known one. Ms. Levy's published boatloads of, of work on that. Then there's the theory of action that was championed here by Paul Nichols and Alex Casillas an assessment design science, uh, which we have, which is kind of the, the road that we were taking a look at. And with assessment design science, we wanted to look at five pieces of the puzzle and that you need to identify the problem and the intended outcomes that you want to look at. And you define the assessment requirements and constraints. One of the big problems with a lot of looking at other assessment design things is they don't look at the constraints. If you were to try and do what NGSS wants you to do to measure students, you would need about 25 hours per student to actually measure all of those outcomes. So we have to actually, in the real world, deal with constraints. So that's part of the piece. Then you need to integrate tacit knowledge from experience with explicit knowledge of research-based literature. So if you look at the technical manual for the WorkKeys 2.0 redesign, there's an extensive literature research base on each of those, particularly the graphic literacy one. I, I did most of the research on the, the construct to develop artifacts. And these artifacts are going to be sample items and blueprints and things like that. And you gather data on the artifacts and evaluate, and you revise those artifacts and improve the solution. Now, it looks like it's linear, but in reality, it's very iterative. Five and four make you go back and go, wait a second, this doesn't make sense. We need to go back and look at some more research because it didn't match what we thought and then revise it. And so you end up with where eye tracking fits into that is in steps four and five. And we started with this because of the five sources of validity evidence in the standards, 
the one on response processes is the one that's most often ignored. It's very easy to collect thousands and thousands of data points on psychometric data and to calculate thetas and p-values and point by serials. It's hard to get cognitive response processes. In COG labs and think alouds, it's hard to get n values that people will respect. It's hard to, to get people in. But this is what was really interesting. In the standards, even though nobody was doing it in assessment, they said specifically, documentation of other aspects of performance like eye movements or response time may also be relevant to some constructs. So they said people should be doing it, but no one was doing it. Part of that was because of cost, and time and the software. And this is the part of the validity evidence that has been ignored because it's just not as easy to collect as these other pieces. And so why eye tracking? Well, when we were looking at eye tracking, we wanted to think of what claims we could make and what evidence we would have to support those claims. And as we were doing that, we specifically wanted to look at, you know, the score meaning and interpretation as the most important facet of it. And it was repeat, so at ITC last year, every presentation that I attended, and pretty much the same at NCME as well, um, for the ones that I chose to attend, this idea that score meaning and interpretation of assessment and validation of the claims you're gonna make about students or test takers in general was super the most important. And the ARA and NCME published an entire book on this um, written by Erka Gann and Pellegrino. And this validation of score meaning um, for the next generation of assessments and the use of those assessments. And a little backstory here, about four or five years ago, ACT sponsored an innovation, incentive, incentive grant that, that Ryan was part of, and I was part of the scoring team along with Steve, a bunch of other guys and, and women here at ACT. And one of the uh, proposals that we saw was to say, let's look at biometric data to see how experts and novices answer test questions in a different way based upon the research of Chi et al. from 1980s, talking about how expert physics solvers look at problems differently from novices. And so that was rattling around in, in, our, in my head about how can we do this to say high scorers are different from low scorers and how people who get items right, how do they do things different from, from people who get them wrong? And we settled on eye tracking for a large part because it's unobtrusive and it no longer affects the testing environment. So if you've ever read Kahneman's work, when he was doing work on eye tracking and particularly pupillometry and cognitive load and type one and type two thinking, literally you had to go into a room and have your head strapped into a little, little thing. Like for those of you who took physiological psychology and you had your little rat thing and you put the rat in there and then you put the electrode in his brain, it was the same sort of thing that you would be strapped in and you would be in a completely dark room and a camera would take a picture of your eyes every half second. And they would put something on a screen in front of you and you would try and do some computation or read it or recite it back. Well, you can't do that with a student at a test. Okay, I want you to take the ICT with your head stuck in this taxonomic thing so that you cannot move left and right. You can't look down at the paper. So one of the reasons why this wasn't done was because it wouldn't be test-like. Now, Sarah's gonna be my model. This is what it amounts to. They put on safety goggles. These are lighter than the safety goggles that my son used for his Eagle Scout project. These are the exact same ones that the US Olympic Committee uses to see where athletes are looking when they're doing various sports. That's how light and obtrusive they are. And for a bunch of the research that we're gonna to see today, you're gonna to see uh, that it's even, those were even less obtrusive than that. Now, <laughs> now, these provide evidence that cannot be verified other ways. Cognitive load. You can get self-reports of cognitive load, but people aren't always honest. Oh, yeah, I worked, thought really hard on that question. I worked really hard. This actually allows us to quantify how much mental effort an individual student or test taker gave on a particular item. We can also look at the focus of gaze, and this is the really big thing here the time spent reading the stimulus, the stem, and the foils rather than just total time. One of the advantages of computer-based testing is that you can get question latency, but you have no idea if any of that time was actual useful thinking time of the student. You just know how long it went from the time that question seven popped up, so they clicked on next to say question eight should come. And we're gonna see some of that, that here. 
So one of the things we want to know about is, are students or test takers in general looking at the stimulus? Are they looking at the stem? Are they looking at the foils? Are they looking into blank space? Because there, are, there will be heat maps up here where test takers are looking at part of the screen where there is no information. But that counts towards their latency. And so if you use only latency as judging whether or not someone is guessing or not, you draw false conclusions because of the data that you're left with. Okay. Now, the other thing is that this is well established in other fields. User experience, web design, and marketing. One of the problems that we come on when doing this with testing is that almost all of this software is designed that every time it starts re-recording, every time a new web page URL pops up which is great if you're Amazon or you're Google or you're ACT's web design folks, but it's a real problem when you have test data. Our test data is all from the same URL and an applet inside the program refreshes the screen, which means there's a whole lot of pre-processing of data that, I, that you literally have to, and Tom's done it and I've done it, you literally have to go in and go, okay, the question started at 52 minutes, 13.67 seconds, and it ended at that, and then you have to slice every question for every participant because the software is all designed based upon those three drivers of the industry. And then uh, cognitive load for safety. So the software that we use for measuring cognitive load has been used by the US military, the National Traffic Safety Board to decide things like, when is the instrument panel of an F-13 too complicated that a pilot might crash? And so it needs to be simplified or they need to put in a co-pilot in a particular vehicle. When do you have too many planes in the air and you have to hire more air traffic safety controllers? Or when truckers have too much cognitive load and need to be get off, get off the road? So this is used by the federal government, it's just nobody's using it for testing. And those are, I'd say that the bomber pilots and things like that are a little bit more high stakes than the ACT. <laughs> so, yes ma'am. Um, can you say more about how this eye tracking is? Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Can you say more about how this eye tracking is measuring cognitive load? Yes, I will later in the, oh, okay. in about 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes after I get through the traditional eye tracking, I will talk exactly about how that works. So we need evidence to support our claims. So we're gonna show that eye tracking can show the sequence of information that people use to solve problems. This is very important for, for the work keys graphic literacy test because we specifically said that certain skills required one cognitive step or two cognitive steps, or three cognitive steps, and it's part of the construct and the way that we define the difficulty level of the item overall from three through seven on the work key scale. It can compare the cognitive effort of different tasks to measure the difficulty beyond just a p-value or an IRTB parameter. And it should correlate, we would hope, with those things since they're all supposed to measure item difficulty. Now, as a teacher, I would tell you that there are certain things that my p-value of my students would show up as being, wait, it's way too easy. I, I will use the example of stoichiometry. Those of you who took high school chemistry probably remember, oh my God, I hate that word. They took forever. My students would traditionally get 90 to 95% of those correct. Not because stoichiometry is easy, but because I had found a really good way to teach that set of skills. And one of the problems with relying only on p-values is that it assumes that the percentage of people who get it right is a measure of the cognitive difficulty, and it ignores things like, the quality of instruction. And then finally, it provides evidence that there are observable differences between the high and low achievers. And again, this goes back to Larkin and Chi's work on expert versus novice problem solving. So we wanted to be able to make those sorts of claims with work keys and other tests. Now, qualitative methods. Um, so visualizations that show where individuals spend significant gaze time there's heat maps, there's sequence maps, there's bee swarms, there are other ones. Bee swarms are generally used initially to just find places of interest where you want to look because they're animations that show all of the participants' eyes flying around the screen at the same time and you go, wait a second, there's a big time lag between what these high performing colors are doing and these low performing colors are doing. And then there are quantitative methods. So these give you area of interest so you can define predefined zones. So the number of fixations, how many times somebody like focus on a particular point, percentage of gaze time, total time, time to first fixation. That's a good measurement of are they going to, how long does it take them to get to the relevant information that you need to solve this problem? If that's really long, you know that that particular individual is using a very circuitous route to get to the important information. And then the number of visits, how often do they come back to that important information? And it's non-invasive and does not greatly alter the test experience. 
And going back to the incentive grant, there were people who were suggesting that we do uh, FNIR, which is an infrared measurement of brain activity where you have to wear a skull cap that's really bulky and um, not very practical. Uh, galvanic skin response is another one where you strap uh, a thing around a kid's chest so that you get their heart rate and their sweating rate. And you do one here and you do one on their wrist. Um, but the nice thing about eye tracking is it's come totally unobtrusive to the student. So a lot of the research that we're gonna talk about today used these bars. So it's identical to a regular computer-based testing, except there's one extra 30-second screen where you have to calibrate the equipment, where you tell the, the student, follow the blinking cursor. So think of all the video games. And so literally, they can move their head as long as they are focusing on the dot as it moves to each corner of the screen in the middle of the screen. And it tells you whether or not your data is of high quality. And then the goggles, okay? And the goggles can be used better for paper and pencil, okay? And uh, the issue with the goggles is that because you can move around in 3D space, you have to do a lot more processing of the data. With a computer screen, theoretically, you know exactly what's on the screen. But there is that other problem. If you've got a math problem, somebody looks down at their scratch paper, you have lost all the gaze data if you were relying on the infrared bar with a computer-based test. And uh, that's one of the reasons why when we collected data for work he's math, we wanted to do that one last because we knew just from a quick cursory glance of the data that a lot of the data is useless because the people are looking at their scratch paper because we still have their scratch paper. We go, wow, if they wrote that much on their scratch paper, they're not looking at the screen, so we're going to lose some information, which is one of the reasons to switch to goggles. So you need to have a hypothesis based on your construct and the claims that you want to make about the test takers. You should have a model of how someone with a high skill level would approach a task. What's the most efficient way that a high skill level person is most likely to do it? And there may be more than one right answer to that, but if we have defined our skills correctly, so again, I'll pick on work he's graphic literacy. If we're asking someone to identify a trend or better yet to extrapolate the trend, in order to extrapolate a trend, you have to find the relevant data in the graphic. Then you have to identify the trend. As X gets bigger, what's happening to Y? Is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? Is it staying the same? And then you have to extend that trend beyond. So we would expect that there would be three sets of gazes and three sets of cognitive efforts along the, that, that path. We should also have a hypothesis about how low scoring people are likely to do it. Now this is really hard. As those of you who are teachers, you know that there might be one right way to do one or two right ways to do a problem. There are an infinite number of wrong ways to do a problem. <laughs> and so justifications are a really good example of that. So if our justifications say, this will be tempting because it's in an adjacent column, or it's in the, or it's at the, it's in the next sentence after the reading part that you're supposed to find, and that's where those people are looking, that's really good. But then you end up with this, what Gottwalls and Songer and learning progression research called the messy middle. The problem with the people in the, in the messy middle is they do some things like a high performer, and they do some things like a low performer, and sometimes it switches based on context. And particularly in a science context where there are misconceptions uh, will really play out. So they did a lab so that they know exactly how this happens this way, but then you give them a different context for the same concept, and they don't do it. An example of this would be like projectile motion. You did the lab where they roll the bowling ball off the table and they understand that it goes a parabola. Then you ask them a, a question about a bullet being shot and they will still hold on to that, to that misconception that bullets move so fast that gravity doesn't start to pull them down until they have gone a long way straight and then they fall straight down. And Tom's laughing, but there's a boatload of research on that and that is a misconception I have heard students do after we spent three days in lab doing all these different, the, the, all, these all these things to attack those misconceptions. Now, ACT's done a lot with research on eye tracking already. So we did a, on the NCRC uh, 2.0 validation on graphic literacy, workplace documents, and workplace math. And two of those three already have that information in their technical manuals for the whole world to see that we are doing this kind of work. Well, one of them's in revision, but it'll be up on the website in a few weeks. Uh, the ACT research related to computer-based testing that was done by the, uh, the group in psychometric research. Uh, we did one with NGSS-based curriculum assessments um, based on some work I'm doing with uh, Michigan State. An ACT Next intern did one on a tutoring and quiz system last summer. Um, we did one on math anxiety for middle school students. And Praveen and his group has been working on a collaborative problem solving one that I forgot to put on there before I uh, put in this. 
And for most of these, we've looked at correct versus incorrect responders. Praveen's work is different because he's not dealing with a testing situation. He's dealing with this collaborative problem solving thing. And then we look at score begins. High scores versus medium scores versus low scores. Now, the problem that we ran into with the score bands issue is that for our samples, we don't have a whole lot of people in the middle score level. Um, one of the artifacts of only having a small sample size, we had a bunch of high scores, we had a bunch of low scores, and very few people scored fours and fives on, on the work keys test that we did. So it's gonna be hard for us to draw about medium scores, but if our real goal is to say high scores and low scores have different skills in the workplace, we can definitely justify those sorts of things. So the way that a heat map here works is that the red areas are gonna represent the highest concentration of time, the highest percentage of time. And then after that, uh, the yellow is a little bit higher, is a little bit lower than that, than the green, than the blue, and whiter areas where people don't really look much at all, at least not enough to measure. And so this is one of the problematic items that we have on work keys 2.0 in the original redesign. This should be a relatively straightforward question. You have to find information right here and then go down to the second graphic right there and it's literally, you find what category it is and then you go down to the other category. And this item tests much more difficult than it should. And so what we did was we, we took a look at the differences between correct and incorrect responders. Now, since you need the, the lower table to get the right answer, you see that incorrect responders don't even look at the second table there's something going on here. One of the pieces of evidence that we have found, and this validates parts of the construct, as soon as you need to use a second graphic or choose from a second graphic, the complexity level of the item and of the graphic goes up because people have to know, oh, I have to look here. What we know is that low scores and people miss questions, as soon as they find information in the first highest graphic, they stop and they go find an answer and they're, they're happy with it because they don't go moving on to the second one. And the other thing is that here's an example of all the quantitative data you can do. You know, the percentage of time that they dwell on, on the second table, 8.3% of the time for the people who get it right, 0.5%. And I went through this and I showed this to one of our psychometricians and, she, and I said, I haven't done a t-test to show if this is statistically significant or not. He says, you know, there were 19 people in the study. It's like, I don't need a t-test to look at that graphic and to look at those numbers to know that there's a significant difference, whether it shows up as statistically significant or not, it is definitely an obvious one. And this is one that you could show to uh, people at a performance level descriptor conference or, and, and state officials and go, yeah, this item is really showing whether or not somebody in the workplace can find information in one table to find information in another table. Like, I gotta find the category to know what price it is. I gotta find the category to find out what the commission sort of thing is. And so, one of the other things that we found is that uh, people who answer, use strong graphic literacy skills, they read the legend. Low, people with low graphic literacy skills never read the legends, they don't read, they don't read the keys, they don't read the access labels. So as a follow-up, we told the key train folks, um, you need to put this as really important information. If you wanna improve your graphic literacy, first thing you need to tell people is they need to read legends, keys, and access labels if they want to improve their graphic literacy skills. Because this is a, one of the most fundament, fundamental skills. If you don't read the key or the legend, you have no idea what the graphic is telling you. And so we could use this information to guide instruction. So thinking about how can assessment lead to ACT being an education company, we can pass this information on to other groups. So again, this is where the important information is found, these two spots, and incorrect responders don't even look. So we can, we can again, draw these conclusions about it. Now, again, correct, do this one real quickly. They don't look at the axes. We've got all these percentage of what time it is. And the, not only did they look at the header, they looked to see which one was the line and which one was the bar graph because they looked at both parts of the legend. That's really important if you've got one of these composite graphics. Now, correct responders look for information in the graphic and incorrect responders try to use the foils to find all the information. So instead of reading the question and going, I need to find this, low level scores and people who get things incorrect tend to focus on the foils. So all that worrying about writing really good foils that everybody in test development knows is important, we now have evidence that says, oh, 
your choice of foils can really drive the p-values. If you make a more, a more compelling distractor, more people are going to choose it. And we can see why it is. It's because low scores spend their time doing that instead of looking in the graphic for the right answer. Okay, now, again, this is the same question that we saw before. They're looking in the wrong spots. This one was really interesting because this has to do with cognitive load and with, with expert versus uh, novice. If you notice, high scores don't look at points along a graphic line, trend line. They chunk it as, oh, that line goes up and that line goes down. They have a broad, diffuse eye pattern. They are already looking for trends. Notice that our low scores, they look at individual points along the way. One of the big differences we know between experts and novices should be that experts chunk information in a meaningful way so they have to deal with less cognitive information in their working memory at any given time because they see trends. But our low scores don't do that. And that becomes really important as the questions become more and more complex because your working memory is going to be the fundamental limitation of what most people are going to be able to do. Now, I'll ask the room. Without reading this question and knowing that high scores are on the left and low scores are on the right, can you tell me where the correct answer would be found on this graphic? It's the big red spot over in the legend area. Now, this is one of the limitations of computer-based testing because it's a different web page, because it's the same web page the whole time. This diffuse area that looks like it, they're not looking at anything is actually a remnant of scrolling issues. So the way the software is designed is that once you start on a particular, uh, a particular web page, it knows exactly where the scroll bar is for that first page that you go to. And it automatically puts it right there for the, everything which is great if every time you click on the next page, you get a new page. So it will automatically show you where the scroll line is. The problem with this is that we actually have to do a screenshot and then overlay this. So if they scroll up and down, we, we cannot trust the statistical data for this. We know that this is really them looking across here, but more importantly, there's still nothing in the legend. So that's one of the problems that, that, that comes with the way that we do testing. And unfortunately, that's nothing we can get around. So we've looked at graphical literacy. Now the reading stuff is even more interesting in many ways because I'm not a reading expert. I, this was not the construct that I had, I, I had to do. So this is the second item on a passage. Well, this is really interesting. The second item on the passage are high achievers. If I were to show you the heat map for that passage, they read it the first time. Not only did they read it, they understood enough that they didn't need to reread the whole question just to find the answer to the second item on the test. So if we want to justify why having multiple questions on a given passage actually measures reading comprehension, we can go, well, high achievers don't need to reread the whole passage every time. But, oops, but our low achievers, they reread the passage like it went in their brain and then fell right out. And so by adding these passages, it's not just affecting the speed in this issue, we're actually measuring a comprehension construct that we say is an important part of workplace, of, of workplace documents. Um, now notice, because they've already read it, they focus on the important part of the STEM, and then they go to the, where the important information is. Whereas our low achievers, they kind of go hunting for words, but they don't actually look in the important information. The other thing that's really interesting to see is that uh, our low scores will oftentimes read the question and then use the common sense answer and completely ignore what's in the passage, which is, not surprising to anybody who's written questions before, but again, this shows us why those are, are good foils, even if they don't relate back to the passage. Now, this is the first item on a passage. Notice what I said before. The, the high achievers read the whole passage. And then notice, they read, you can't tell that they're reading left or right, but it certainly looks like that they certainly read the entire sentences they went through. And when they got down to the sincerely part, they knew, I, I, don't, I know what's coming after sincerely. I don't really need to spend a whole lot of time there because I know how it works. Then they spend a lot of focused time reading the question and making sure they understand what it is asking them to do. And then they will go back and spend extra time on the important part. If you notice the vertical stripes on the right-hand side, our low achievers don't really read left to right and don't read entire sentences. Now, just to let you know, a low achiever on the workplace document was defined as somebody who got a three or no score, failing score. 
uh, less than three, I guess is what they call it, but they did not achieve even a bronze level certificate. So this is bronze and below, okay? Now, there gets to a point where not even on the most complicated passages where our low achievers, the, I have no chance of understanding that. I'm just gonna read the answers and I might go hunting or I might just try and figure it out from what I already know, but they're certainly not gonna read that big long passage. So we know that this person that we're saying can't handle level five, six, seven, or even level four text from workplace documents. We actually have evidence to show the people who score three and below, yeah, they, they see that and they're overwhelmed and they don't even know where to start, which is really strong evidence of the claims that we're making about the differences between these people in the workplace. Um, now, this is a sequence map. Now, sequence maps are really interesting in that the size of the circle indicates how long an individual focused, or technically the term has had a fixation on a particular word. And then the lines that join the circles, are, those are called saccades. And for a normal person, when you're reading, what you'll see is most of the saccades will move from left to right, and there'll be some that jump backwards from right to left. It's called retrograde reading. And that indicates that you're going back to a previous word to help you understand a word or phrase that you don't understand. Think about how a normal college graduate reads, you read left to right, oh wait, that didn't make sense, I, you jump back and you reread that part of the sentence. The bigger the circle, the more time. Reading experts will tell you that large circles indicate a failure to recognize a vocabulary word or a problem in decoding a word. This person on the left, all the, the six biggest circles are all words that are sixth grade or lower in the corpus. This person cannot understand sixth grade level vocabulary. The person on the right, has a giant circle for virtually every word on the page. That person scored a three, and a three indicates that they had a bronze level. They struggled with reading virtually every word regardless of grade level. Now, we're gonna play this out and I'm gonna point some things out. This is the actual time-lapse sequence map of our low score. So as you're gonna notice, they're kind of looking not really where they're supposed to. And then when they get to the point where they're supposed to be reading, okay, there's a little bit of left to right work. And then there's jumping several words ahead, then jumping way to say, that doesn't look very much like reading. Now you're gonna see that they spend a lot of time focusing on words in the stems. So they, they found four words that they wanna look at. And then they're going to go look in a vertical word search scan, like you and I would go, oh, I need a word that starts with K. Oh, go ahead and restart that. And I will put that away from my hand so I don't accidentally bump it. Um, and this, it's like, literally, it's just like a word search where they are looking for the exact word match. And uh, if it's a variant of the word, so it goes from being a regular verb to a gerund with an ing, it's not an exact match. They will not mark that as the correct answer. The, and I, we don't know if this is a poor reading schedule, uh, a poor reading strategy, or if this is a test taking strategy that they have learned that is very maladaptive, because unfortunately, we didn't ask those questions in our post interview because we didn't think of them. But we're going to ask them the next time when we, when we do our next set of research with this, because as you're gonna see, they're looking, they're looking in the answers. Each one of those diamonds, by the way, represents mouse clicks. So a diamond is a mouse click. So they're clicking on words they want, they want to look for to help them remember and as you can see, not a single sentence was read all the way. And they were vertically scanning on the left for specific word matches. That's not reading. For us, so we know this person cannot function with reading above even the most rudimentary level in the workplace. And we have evidence to show that people who score at this level, that's the way that they, they process these items. Now, back to your question about pupillometry. This is the really fascinating stuff. This has been around for over 100 years. People know that when you have to engage in cognitive effort, your eyes will, your pupils will dilate very rapidly, as opposed to the constriction reflex, which is a slow response to high amounts of light. Okay, so as a big fan of MASH, pupils are fixed and dilated and, and they, they do all those sorts of things. And they, they've known about these sorts of things for years. And in the 1960s, Conlon, Beatty, and others investigated how the more difficult the task, the greater the dilation. Because that was the limitation of the technology that they had. They could take a camera picture every half second of somebody's head strapped into a vice 
while they put up some math problem or they read something to them and they had to recite it backwards or whatever the, the cognitive task. These were very much rote or kind of simple tasks. Um, using better technology in the early 2000s, Marshall found that cognitive load is actually related to the velocity and accelerate, acceleration of these pupil changes. Because the new equipment takes somewhere between 60 readings and 250 readings per second, we can now find the velocity of that pupil dilation. We can find the acceleration. And based upon some Fourier transformations that she's got a patent for that we don't need to understand because we bought the software because it was much more efficient than building it and writing it for ourselves from scratch, we know that it has been validated by the federal government that that rate of acceleration and velocity is a measure of the instantaneous cognitive load that you are experiencing during that fixation, that saccade, or from blink to blink. So if before you blink and after you blink, your pupil is dilated a great amount, they know that you have engaged in thought during that amount, during that time. There's a question here. Yes. Um, the patterns we see on the screen are for one person or a group of people. I okay. answered them and I said the last slide was a recording of one person. That, that was a recording of one person. Uh, when I had high achievers versus low achievers, those were groups of students in those categories. And then those two sequence maps were two particular low achieving scores. I mean, we could lay a whole bunch of, the problem with laying a whole bunch of sequence maps over top of each other is that you can't tell who's what anymore. So that's why these heat maps are generally used for large group data. And then the question is, how many people are in those groups? Uh, for the workplace, for graphic literacy, the high level group uh, was, I, I, I have to look at the, the slide later. I believe there were 11 in the high and five or six in the low. And for the workplace documents, um, this study design was based upon the fact that graphic literacy had the largest change from the previous work keys. So all 20 participants did graphic literacy. Half of them were assigned to math, half of them were assigned to uh, re workplace documents. So we have a lot more data for graphic literacy because that had the largest changes. And then one of the people's data is unusable for certain things. Um, the girl would sit on her knees and she kept moving around. And so uh, the rule of thumb is if you lose more than 30% of the data as being off the screen, you can't use it. So we had to take one of the girl's data and um, throw her data out for a lot of these analyses. We could have done sequence maps for her individually, but uh, because so much of it was, was lost. Yes, Tom. Yeah, yeah, just press the button. Okay, okay, so for the workplace document, it was seven high achieving students, two low achieving students, and we had one mid-level person for that. So, um, excellent. So here's some examples of, of different ones that people have used pupillometry studies for over the year. The interesting thing is, of course, that no one has done anything with assessment. In 1968, a group over at ETS said we should be using pupillometry to measure item difficulty rather than just p-values because we really need to know how hard people have to engage in cognitive effort to know how hard an item really is. They wrote that paper in 1968. ETS has still never done that study. Our first study on that is being published currently in the Journal of Educational Measurement. and We're the only people in the world using pupillometry to validate cognitive difficulty of items. And part of that was because the technology didn't exist until a few years ago. And I will give a shout out to the Office for Innovation on this one. I applied for a grant to get the equipment because we didn't have money. And Miguel said, if you want to do something innovative, you can apply for money to do this. And I said, oh, we're going to take this idea from the Innocentive Grant and we're going to, use the, we're going to apply for these accelerator funds. And because uh, Amit... And Miguel, we got the money, we got the equipment, we were able to do these studies. And it really is a big differentiator because we are literally the only assessment company in the world doing this to validate our claims about test takers. So now gets the really interesting part to me because this is, this is the, from a educational psychology background that mine is, my, I have a bachelor's and a master's in psych. Um, this is really cool stuff. So the instantaneous cognitive load, we, that, that idea that it's caused by the working memory use and the interactions with long-term memory as a person solves a task. So we know that there's going to be some part of, you're going to have schema that are going to allow you to do things more efficiently than others. But we know that, the, that, that it's still going to be there in terms of cognitive load. So we came up with this 
idea of total cognitive effort. And what we did was we took a rectangular approximation of all the data. So literally for 250 measurements every second, you get an ice, well, actually you don't get 200, it takes 250 measurements, but it only spits out every time that it's a change from a saccade to a fixation to a blink or mouse click. And it spits out all this data. And we said, well, shouldn't the cognitive effort be the sum of all the individual efforts of all those measurements? I'm thinking like a physicist who's taking calculus. And I go, yes, this is just like work. This is like PV work. If I take all those little differentials and I add them together, I should get the total. And so we said we should be able to take each measurement and its ICA value and multiply it by the time interval over which that, that, that was taken. And that should, give us an in, that should give us a cognitive effort for that measurement. And then if we add those all together, that we should get the total cognitive effort for an item from the time it pops up on the screen to when they click next. Seemed perfectly logical to me. So Tom and I called uh, Sandra Marshall who came up with the software in the first place. She's like, yeah, that, that's really obvious. That's, that's really cool. And what are you using for? We said assessment. She said, oh, I'm so happy that somebody's finally doing this with assessment. That's what I really want to do with this. But um, the military and the National Traffic Safety Board on my research. So that's why I do that because that's where I could get the money to do it. It's, it's nice to know that money is not just a limitation here, it's a limitation at the University of San Diego as well. And so we sum these individual uh, with a rectangular approximation and uh, the group that worked on this, including Ron and Tom and Carrie and I, uh, that's in press right now. So you can read the abstract of the Journal of Educational Measurement, but that's about it. It should be out in the next couple months. And so this is an example for one item for one person of all of the individual measurements summed together. So on the left-hand side is the total cognitive effort, and the uh, x-axis is the time that that person spent on that particular item. A couple things to be aware of. Every time that there is a change in slope, that should indicate a change in cognitive effort, which from a psychological standpoint should probably mean a change in some sort of psychological process or skill that's being used. Either they're adding in more data, they're, they're, they're accessing their, their working memory, they're accessing their long-term memory. Something's going on that's causing that to go up. And so we're able to generate a graph like that for every item for every person who took the test if we wanted to. And so what we wanted to do, in, in addition to that, we have this theory about it, that for each task on the test, there's a maximum instantaneous cognitive load, a, a mic demand is what, we, is what I called it. That, that's the hardest part of the item. When you have to deal with the most data at the same time, with the most complex cognitive processes, that that's the hardest part of the problem that you have to do. And then there's this total cognitive effort that's required to, to solve the task. And that's really an area of space because you might do that by working really hard for a short period of time. You might be the, the tortoise and the hare. You might be slow but steady wins the race. But your area, the total area of, of the total cognitive effort for an item is gonna be what it takes based upon the skills and the amount of data that you have to process. And then a different task will have different amounts. So task two is a harder task that requires more effort overall. Now, on that we can overlay that individuals who take the test have knowledge, skills, and abilities that they use so they don't have to do everything in working memory. Okay. So for example, I don't have to think, oh, 12 times 12. Well, that's two times two plus two times 10 plus 10 times two. I don't have to go through that. I know 12 times 12 is 144. I can instantaneously recall that. I'm not gonna go through all of the cognitive effort that my son when he was in second and third grade and was learning his times tables is gonna do. I'm going to use that sort of knowledge to do it. And so the more you have knowledge, skills, and ability, the less effort you have to exert on doing the question because you can use some prior schema that you've already learned. That's good because we would say people with high levels of knowledge, skills, and ability should not have to think as hard to answer the questions. Then on top of that, there's this personal overload threshold. And a bunch of people have called it different things. Pause has got a name for it. Uh, uh, Wise has got a name for it. He talked to us at, at a conference. Um, there's a certain amount of effort you're willing to give on an item before you give up. And if it exceeds that amount, you're just going to guess. Or you're going to learn some other skills. So for instance, my AP students were told that if you don't know how to do the answer to part B on a question, but you know that you need that answer for part C, you know how to do that? On the AP exam, they use propagation of error. So you say, I'm going to assume the answer to part B is 0.25 molarity. And then they do the rest of the problem from there because they can get the rest of the points. And on some tests, you can do that. On a multiple choice test, 
where there's not propagation of error, you cannot do that. And so you might have different people with different skills that are able to do different things. Now, here are three individuals. These are gonna be the same three individuals for a series of slides. The high score you're gonna notice is in blue. The low score, this is a level four item, so this is just beyond what he scored. He scored a three, this is a level four. But he's certainly engaging in a lot of effort. Notice that the middle score, it's got a really steep line. He engages in high effort all the time. Every item has a steep slope. Again, when we do follow-up studies, we're gonna ask the students in follow-up questions, do you feel like you have to rush to get through these tests? Do you feel like you have to engage in high effort, high cognitive effort all the time so that you can get through these things? Because I think that's what this student has learned. Is I have to rush to get through things like the ACT because he always engages in high cognitive effort. And the blue line, this is a slow but steady high score. Now, our low score, got this one right, got the previous one wrong. Lots and lots of effort on the last one. Now, more than 20 seconds spent on the question, which means by time, not guessing. More than 10% of the average, by time, latency, not guessing. But you look at that graph, and the yellow, and you go, yeah, that person spent nine to 10 seconds figuring out, reading the question, do I know how to do this? And then staring at the screen for nine or 10 seconds going, nope, I'm screwed. I have no way of answering this question, I better guess. And then after 20 seconds, they guess and they got it right. Now notice, our, our middle score, if you look at just latency, you would go, that person's super efficient. They answered it like 50% faster than the, than the high score. But then you look at how much cognitive effort it took to do. There's no chunking going on or, or whatever process, whatever that, that person is doing, they're putting in 50,000 units of mental effort, whereas my high score here is putting in less than 25,000. Latency is not the only measurement of how hard someone has to think to answer a question. How hard they think is how hard they think. The problem is it's really hard to do this with every student on every test. So we've got to do some, some validity labs to, to come up with this. And then you can look at groups of students. Now, if our construct is correct, easy, low, moderate, high, moderate, complex, the more complex a graphic is, the harder someone should have to think to the more cognitive effort it should take. And for most people, you'll see, hey, it goes up, it goes up. It goes up, it goes down a little bit, but they're still really high on everything. So that could just be some noise in the data. But then you see a couple people, they definitely go down. Now, if I use Wise's explanation, people get to a point where, or the zone of proximal development, people know when they don't know something. And they go, yep, I, I don't know how to do this. I might as well just guess and move on. Now, what's really interesting on all of these is that there was one complex graphic that was two really dense tables that were really, really hard questions that even our lowest people tried really hard on. But that goes back to our construct definition. One of our construct definitions about the complexity of a graphic is familiarity. And everybody's familiar with tables. Even if they're dense and have lots of information, people think they can understand them. And so they'll try on those questions. Conversely, on the last passage, it was this really weird process diagram that you don't normally see except in workplace things. And they took one look at that and they're like, yeah, no. And then they guessed on the last three items. And, which was not surprising given our construct and understanding how, how test takers work. Now, this is the really cool thing. When you group these things together, our medium and low, high scores follows our construct exactly the way you would predict. For graphic complexity, the number of cognitive steps, it goes up. For our low performers, they're beyond what they can do. And they know when they're beat. Which might lead to some ideas about, can we get to a point where we can measure these things and go, okay, we don't need to waste this person's time anymore. They're level four. We could ask them another thousand questions. They're still going to be a level four. This is the kind of evidence that you could use to have one of those kind of screening tests. And then for overall item difficulty, that looks exactly what the contract says it should. That's really powerful evidence that when we redesign this test, we redesign it the correct way. And then how does it correlate with all those cool psychometric statistics that, that Ron does? Well, the median total cognitive effort correlates the graphic complexity, cognitive steps, and overall complexity level at a 0.62 level. And we used median rather than any of the others to get rid of the extremes. And it's, to be perfectly honest, your really conscientious smart kid who double checks every answer is gonna skew everything off, off the charts anyway. But it, it's really nice to look at that and it, it works really well. It also correlates to both discrimination and our B difficulty parameter. So everything that should say something requires more cognitive effort. Now, that discrimination 
Is that a persistence factor? I'm not certain, but I'm going to ask those questions in our follow-up study when we do research on the ACT. Or if we go back and do more research on work keys, is that high correlation a measure of something else in the holistic framework, like persistence? So our next steps. Next month, we're beginning to do a research on the ACT proper. We've got, we're scheduling 30 students to come in to do eye tracking research on, on the English part, ELA, math and science parts of the test. You know, we're going to compare to other cog, cog labs. We had one this summer on work keys graphic literacy where we're looking at the difference between a retrospective think aloud and a concurrent think aloud and how their eye, so when you let people see where they're looking and they're explaining what they were doing, see how that matches up and also how their cognitive load compares to between doing it with a think aloud, which we know adds cognitive load for anything that's not automatic, and then use this as well evidence in peer review and RFPs. We can stand in a room and go, college board, what do you got? You got nothing like this. AIR, what do you have? You got nothing like this. This is a differentiator that shows that we really understand that you have to have validity evidence about these claims, about the differences between test takers, that other people are just relying on psychometrics. And we can go, there are differences in the way these people think, what they know, and what they do, which going back to the assessment triangle is what we're supposed to be doing with assessment. So any questions? Uh, Steve. This is the first time I've seen this at this level of depth, and it's impressive, <laughs> um, one. But uh, so I guess my first question is, you know, obviously what we're getting is a lot of insight about individual items and item design and assessment design. Um, and, I, and I like the correlations that we were seeing. What, what do we imagine, though, would be useful with this data to ultimately tie back to the outcome data, the score data for the students? I mean, what can we use from all of this rich data to improve our, ultimately, the scores that we're trying to give to the students okay. and not just be gathering really great data about how items are performing and how students are interacting okay. with items? One thing is that we can take this to the education side of what we're doing. And the, the key train would be a good example. When we can see that there are these differences, we can say, this is where you need to target your instruction first. For those low scores on reading, reading comprehension is not where, that's, where those students need to start. They need to go all the way back to low level phonics, word recognition, steps to be perfectly honest that are even below what we normally measure in Aspire. So we can use some of this data to say, we need to, to look even lower. So in terms of guiding education. The other thing that, that's going to be interesting is that uh, the equipment that was used for most of these studies was bought by Apple. So SMI, the bars that we use, all of their instrumentation has been bought by Apple and they will not sell to researchers like us anymore because Apple is going to be putting eye tracking into all of their next generation of devices. And we don't know if it's going to be for control, like is oftentimes done for special needs people, or if it's going to be used to replace keyboards and mouse and things like that. So it may be that Apple is going to give us a way of collecting all that data on everyone who takes a test on one of their products. Now, they're not talking, and SMI won't return calls because they're not allowed to anymore. So we will find out when the rest of the industry finds out but that might be a possibility for a partnership later. So those are the two ones that I can think of, but Tom, yeah. uh, you can. Yeah, Steve, uh, the other area I think where this has potential too has to do with uh, item and task development in a sense that we can see what kind of items engage students and have them really put forth cognitive effort and which kind of items uh, leave them kind of flat. So I think for development and content, I think it has a lot of potential too. And there's a follow-up study with the math one that we, we've done that I haven't analyzed any of the eye tracking data. We actually have software that will look at videotapes of the face to look at engagement, frustration, um, the big seven circumplex emotions. So theoretically, while we're doing this, we can see which passages and tasks are more engaging to students as well. Question from online. This is from Scott Payne. Have you ever measured participants' working memory in an effort to account for the ways in which working memory capacity limitations may influence performance? 
I have not, but other people have in other research. So we've cited it in, in our, in kind of the explanation of, of those graphs with the, um, the building blocks and the mic lines, but we haven't done that. Part of that is that we're still finishing analyzing data that we have that's a year and a half old because this is not my full-time job. My full-time job is I'm an assessment designer for science. So this is a side project that we fit in where we can and we rush through the graphic literacy specifically because we needed to validate that one first. But yeah, I, we would love to do that. Yes. Yeah, very wonderful research. Yeah, impressive. So I have a question because you mentioned the low versus uh, high mm -hmm. uh, scorers. And have you got a chance to look at like the item difficulties, whether these high versus low show the similar patterns? Yeah, because that, that would be the correlation work that Ron did. Yeah, similar one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? Mm -hmm. I have questions. Uh, in terms of uh, when we use the bar, mm -hmm. at least for our collaborative problem solving, and there are the two things. One is the in-screen recording and on the web-based recording for mm -hmm. 2B. So what is your opinion on any difference between in-screen recording or if we choose option web-based web recording? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry, Praveen. Uh, we have the bars, right. of the glasses, and there are two options for the 2B. It provides in-screen recording mm -hmm. and web-based recording. So I wonder if it makes any difference in terms of the measurement or anything. That would be a better question for Lori Davis's group because I haven't used the Toby equipment yet. So uh, Sweet San Pedro has used that equipment more than I have. Um, I've only piloted it just to see if it worked or not. So the person you would want to talk to is Sweet. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Go ahead. So push the button so everybody else can hear you. So, so my question is, you talked about you're going to interview the people this next time and ask them like um, how they know what they read and why they're skipping all over the place. But, and maybe I'm being too judgmental or whatever, but if you're a lower performer, you might not know why you're doing that. So like what kind of questions or how do you get them to tell you this is why I read the word chimney and so, then go back and. So one of the things, one of the, so that's what one of the questions we're working on is one of the questions is going to be, how do you approach reading questions? Do you read the passage first or the item first? When, after you, after you read the question, do you read the answers or do you go try and find it in the, and so we're going to look to see if they're, if they're, if they've got enough metacognition to understand, yes, this is what I'm doing or I'm not doing that. So, uh, we're working on that batch of questions, Toby, and we'll, if you have any suggestions, we would love to have them because that's what I'm working on now is the protocol for the next study. Any other question? So, uh, it's, I'm uh, really thankful for Jay. Uh, this is really interesting and very practically very important uh, work. Uh, as uh, we are experiencing, uh, as Jay mentioned, we are working on a collaborative problem solving crisis in a space game uh, for uh, which we are using for the measurement of these uh, CPS skills. And we also find when we use this uh, multimodal analytics from the Toby eye tracking as well as uh, different modalities from video, this is really adding significant things in terms of giving uh, the participant about their skills. So Jay, uh, we always, uh, if we have difficulty, we go to Jay and he always uh, have answers ready. So he's really a uh, useful resource for our work also. So thanks for a uh, very interesting work as well as uh, Sarah for uh, accepting invitations, uh, introducing Jay and hosting this session, uh, as well as all of you for your active participation uh, here, as well as uh, Zoom participant for the uh, very interesting question. Uh, more importantly, our, uh, Extraordinary ACT Next team, Andrew Cantony, Adam Brook, Matt, uh, Toby Drake, and Deborah Glass. Without their support, this work uh, presentation of Tech Talk is not smooth. As well as, I can't forget uh, this uh, Eric. He is making his uh, work. Uh, there are the uh, our ACT members not uh, in United States now worldwide. Now they are watching all over the world. So. Zoom is uh, making, and with Eric's help, it is very uh, streamlining smoothly. So thank you all. Uh, before I uh, stop, I want to 
uh, introduce you in our uh, tech talk series. Uh, next interesting talk will be uh, from Dr. Ryan Wokorner. He is a lead assessment specialist in assessment design, ACT Next, ACT, and Brandon Dorman. He is a lead assessment specialist uh, in uh, learning resources at ACT. So both they will uh, deliver an interesting talk on Jane and the art of competency maintenance on November 14. So we look forward for your presence for this another interesting talk in TikTok series. Thank you very much.